74th president of the American Medical Association and the organization's first African-American to hold the position. A native of Bluefield, West Virginia, Dr. Harris is a graduate of West Virginia University where she completed her bachelor's magna cum laude, a master's in counseling and medical school. She subsequently completed uh, fellowships in both child and adolescent and forensic psychiatry at Emory where she's an adjunct professor. Dr. Harris has devoted her career to caring for patients, to organized medicine, and to public health. She's been at the forefront of the debates on the opioid epidemic, gun violence, mental health parity, and most recently, COVID-19. We are devo devo delighted to welcome the trailblazer, Dr. Patrice Harris, to Chet Talks. Patrice, welcome. Thank you, Ray. Good to be with you. And, and Ray, if I could just make one slight correction, and I do so because particularly as an African-American woman who is a first, I want to make sure I honor those upon whose shoulders I stand. I am the first African-American woman president of the AMA, but Dr. Lonnie Bristow was the first African-American president of the AMA, I believe in the, in the mid 80s. I just wanted to. Outstanding. Uh, and our apologies to Dr. Bristow. Uh, thanks very much, Ed Patrice. <laughs> Um, so let's begin with your service to the American Medical Association. Uh, you've been an active leader and engaged in organized medicine for the last 20 years. You've served on the AMA's board of trustees as, as its president and now as its immediate past president. What drew you to the AMA? Well, I have to tell you, it was really about what drew me to organized medicine, right? So I have to tell you at the end of my fellowship training at Emory, I went down to the Capitol the Gold Dome here in Georgia, psychiatrist day at the Capitol. And let's just say uh, that our citizen legislators are part-time here in Georgia. Um, of course, they don't have a lot of staff. Um, they did not always have the best evidence-based information. And I, I saw that, I witnessed that firsthand. And I knew that it was important for physicians uh, to be engaged and involved. And from there, I actually became a lobbyist for the psychiatrist and did a lot of work regarding medicine. I then became an advocate for children who have been maltreated. And I was doing that though in my individual capacity, but having seen the power of physicians working together, actually multidisciplinary uh, teams working together at the Capitol for a cause. I knew it was important to get involved in organized medicine. And so first at the local and state level, uh, then at the American Psychiatric Association, and then became engaged and involved at uh, the AMA. And, and I'll just say, you know, it was APA, the American Psychiatric Association who said, listen, um, psychiatrists haven't always been um, as included in the house of medicine. And so we wanna make sure that psychiatrists are on every decision-making committee at the AMA. And someday we'd like to have a psychiatrist from our delegation be the president. And so after years of planning and hard work and a lot of partnerships, I was elected uh, president uh, elect in 2018. Outstanding. Uh, just a reminder for our viewers, uh, if you have questions, we're going to take your questions, just put them in the Q&A and we'll uh, uh, get to them uh, toward the end of our conversation. So 20 years in organized medicine and especially with AMA, what are you most proud of? I'd say a couple of things. You know, there, there's the there's the visible out loud part, I, I, I say, and then there's the quiet part. So the visible out loud part is that I have been uh, able to be tangible evidence. As, as I travel the country as president-elect and president, so many college students, and sometimes I even talk to high school students, medical students said, what an inspiration I was. I have to say, I was surprised by that. Um, there would be long lines waiting to talk with me after a talk. And I would always turn around and say, who are they waiting <laughs> to talk to? And um, I was humbled by that, um, actually, and also uh, realized the awesome responsibility. So I'm just very proud of being tangible um, representation of what uh, young Black girls, Black boys, young folks of color can aspire to be. And then there are the quiet moments, the moments, and, and I do believe that leadership is full of quiet moments. It's not the corner office. It's not the position. Um, it's not the title, the parking spot. And so just let me just say some quiet moments is, you know, when I've been in the room and I've been the only woman or the only African-American and I have always spoke 
uh, spoken truth to power. Um, I've never been shy, although it's not always been easy to be the disconfirming opinion. We talk about that at the AMA when you're the only one who has that opinion and you might not uh, have total confidence that, you know, again, uh, maybe it's me, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, and so I've been very proud of always uh, being the disconfirming opinion, um, even uh, when I was the only one. Um, so there's so influence, there's a quiet influence, and then the visible out loud influence. So I'm the disconfirming opinion. Uh, what's the biggest misconception of the AMA? You know, there are a lot, uh, actually, as I've traveled, and it's interesting to me because I've had folks come up to me and say, you know, I, I, I haven't joined the AMA because you all uh, only care about uh, uh, pocketbook issues. And then I'd be at the same meeting sometimes and someone would come up to me and said, you know, I, I'm, I'm just concerned about the AMA because all you all care about is public health issues. And, it, you know, and clearly we are a huge organization that does a lot. Um, and not everything we do is on the front page of the New York Times, hopefully not a lot, but we're doing on the front. Uh, and there's so much to our story that actually um, we have been uh, telling um, it better. And I think any organization will say, you know, we, we need to tell our story better. And so, and I think it's just uh, folks don't appreciate the breadth and depth of the work uh, that had been done before me and, and, and that we do and our policy development and a little bit of a nerdy side. And by the way, I'm a democracy nerd, a very democratic process at the AMA and too, too boring to go into. But our policy is set not by the 21 members of the board, of which I've been honored to be a member since 2011, but by our House of Delegates. And those are just, I call it the Congress of Medicine. Representatives come from every state, every specialty, young physicians, medical students, minority affairs, international medical graduates come together twice a year um, and set policy. And so we're a very democratic organization and our policy is, is set um, in that very democratic fashion. I'm going to come back to that democratic uh, fashion in a second. One of the perceptions or maybe misperceptions of the AMA is it's not viewed as necessarily the most progressive organization, yet now it's elected, I think, three consecutive women uh, as the leaders of the AMA. Um, what's the truth? Yes. Well, you know, I shy away from either or organization. So I will say uh, the organization in, in 2019, 2021, um, is not the same as the organization was years ago. And I, I am proud of that and glad of it, that any organization um, who has the same policies, the same leaders as they had several years ago is not an organization that is progressing. And so if you looked at the House of Delegates from even five years ago, um, it will be different from the House of Delegates that you see today. And as you noted, um, I was one of three uh, presidents, I, would, I called us we three, uh, who were elected uh, to AMA leadership. When I first was elected to the board of the American Medical Association in 2011, seven of the 21 members of the board were women. Um, year before last, five of the 21 members were black, were African-American. Uh, and so I believe that if you look today, you will not see uh, the same organization um, that you saw 20 years ago. And, and really that has been my personal mantra. I have always believed in change from within. I certainly uh, know that some people believe strongly in change uh, from without or change externally. And each one of us has to make our personal choice. Uh, but I have always been a joiner and I've always been about um, changing from within and getting involved and engaged. And if you see a problem, uh, take a solution with you and join and fight uh, to change the organization. Uh, so let's go let's, uh, continue that conversation on change and democracy. So in the 1950s and 1960s, the AMA was a staunch uh, opponent of uh, Medicare, even hired the actor, Ron, the then actor Ronald Reagan uh, to lobby against a Medicare and socialized medicine. But uh, I think 2019, 47% of the AMA's House of Delegates uh, voted to uh, end its opposition to single payer. 
uh, where did, what's changed and where's the AMA going in with respect to Medicare? And I would say you missed uh, one uh, right piece of important uh, history in that uh, you were correct in 1963 and in 2009, and I, kn I know you know this, but I always point this out, the AMA was a staunch supporter of the Affordable Care Act. And we have been uh, since then. And, and again, as you note, uh, the, and by the way, that debate on single payer or all those, not a new debate. Uh, it got a lot of press that year, but um, every, and I don't know if we have the debate every meeting, again, we uh, and have our policy meetings in June of every year and November of every year. COVID notwithstanding, we made some changes this year, and of course, they're not meeting in, in person. Uh, but, um, you know, so that debate um, has been around, and I think that's the hallmark, by the way, of any uh, good organization is you have a diversity uh, of opinion and thought. And again, getting back to our democratic process, uh, we had a rigorous, vigorous, fair-minded debate. I'm so proud of that at the AMA and, and organizations like yours where we, uh, you know, bring data to the debate. Doesn't always happen, uh, as, as we all know, especially in politics. But again, our policy is vigorously debated first in committee. This gets a little wonky. But then in our, our full house, uh, now uh, you have to win a majority. That's the way democracy works. Uh, you know, I just take a second here. I, I would say that, and I've been saying that for years. And then I would move on to the next thing. That's the way democracy works. Um, and because I think that um, we've taken democracy for granted in this country, and I think recently we've seen what happens when you want to, or how democ how fragile democracy is. Now, let me just say. Uh, that the overall democracy and the uh, democratic process in our, our country um, is, is a bigger issue than the democratic process in the AMA. And by the way, the democratic process of the AMA is, is not fragile. Uh, we hold uh, true uh, to democracy in our house, but it was a vigorous debate. Um, and there was lots of debates. Some folks said we should re uh, become neutral and oppose and some folks said support. And I do, and so, but again, um, uh, it was not 51% in order to change policy at the AMA. Uh, you have to have, you know, 50% uh, plus one. I do want to make this point though, and I think this is broader than the AMA that, you know, as we've talked about then and have talked about since then, um, single payer means different things to different people, right? And so when you debate single payer, in some um, aspects, you're debating something in the abstract, right? Um, because we weren't debating a piece of legislation, we were debating the, uh, uh, the concept in general. So, uh, but again, uh, you know, uh, we continue at the AMA, I'm rotating off the board in June. Uh, it's, it's been a, a, an honor and a privilege, but uh, the democratic process will continue and those debates will continue and I will stay engaged and involved. I, I won't have voting privileges, but I will be there on the House always listening uh, and appreciating uh, democracy in the House of Medicine. We're not going to let you get off too easy, though. Uh, so President Biden has a public indicated desire to expand Medicare eligibility to those over 60 uh, what are your thoughts and where do you think the, uh, what do you think the AMA's position will be? So first of all, con congratulations. Of course, we, you know, uh, President Biden was uh, there and in the room uh, where it happened with the Affordable uh, Care Act. And so uh, I can tell you that the AMA remains committed to making sure uh, that everyone has access to affordable, meaningful health coverage, how we get there. Uh, there are different ways to get there. Um, we are always, uh, we have a great uh, team in DC. Um, the physicians who are leaders in the AMA are engaged not only at the federal level, but on the state level in policy debates and discussion. And so, um, you know, I, we will see if a plan, if a piece of legislation is, is put forward, of course, uh, we will be, the AMA will be engaged and involved in reviewing that plan. And here's how the AMA uh, reviews every piece of health related legislation. And I spent, before uh, I was elected to the board, I spent eight years on the AMA's Council on Legislation. And that council is made up of eight uh, members from across this country who, along with our staff, vet 
every piece of federal legislation that is related to health policy. And we vet it in terms of AMA policy. Does it comport with AMA policy? Does it not? Not Patrice Harris's policy or an opinion, not an individual's uh, a policy or opinion, but the AMA's policy and opinion. And so any piece of legislation um, that comes uh, from the Biden administration, we will continue uh, to do the same, trying to get to a place uh, where we have um, everyone having access to that. And clearly, uh, you know, we believe that we should build upon the Affordable Care Act and that it's better to have uh, options and a plurality of options rather than one, uh, one size fits all approach there. Uh, what else should be the priorities for the Biden administration with respect to health care? Well, I will tell you right now, and the Biden administration is, is, is doing this work, uh, the COVID, uh, of, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic has got to be the number one priority. But it, here's what I, I, I say all the time, uh, not just an answer to this question. Um, when you look at a number one priority, you hopefully, and I think the Biden team is doing this and many others do this, it's not, you find out if you dig deeper, right? If you take the time uh, to appreciate the context, you have to get beneath the headlines because listen, this COVID-19 pandemic has elevated uh, so many issues that many of us, I know uh, folks in this audience already knew, many of us already knew about the health inequities. Uh, however, I will tell you what this uh, pandemic has forced us to do is have a conversation about racism and structural racism and more conversations about the interconnection between the social determinants of health, again, and the structural uh, determinants of health, and that it's not a genetic uh, issue if you're black or you're brown um, as to the reason that black and brown people, uh, indigenous people are dying more, hospitalized more. It's the racism, again, as we say, racism, not race, is these, these other um, issues that have brought this issue to the fore. We are having uh, more conversations about mental health care in this country. As a psychiatrist, I know we have not had um, the conversations around mental health care. Certainly, we have not funded it. Another issue, and there, there's just a lot. So I would say when you say one priority, you have to dig, dig deep. And by the way, the Biden team is already, of course, on COVID. Uh, they appointed for the first time uh, Dr. Marcella Nunez-Smith uh, as their um, lead, right, around equity. I remember getting chills the first time I heard her speak and how that conversation has been elevated, um, you know, in the way that it's been elevated. Other presidents, President Obama certainly talked about these issues, but again, we have a person that is responsible for equity uh, related to COVID, but related to vaccine, uh, equitable vaccine uh, distribution. And so she, what did, what words did she say that we hadn't heard uh, said a lot from that pulpit? Uh, social determinants of health, again, structural racism. And so uh, the Biden administration has certainly hit the ground running. Um, and as they have the top line priority of COVID, um, all of those other issues that must be addressed um, and they are uh, committed uh, thus far as what I've seen uh, to addressing those, those other issues. We're getting some questions. I want to touch on them, uh, both mental health and uh, COVID. Um, one uh, basic question, easy one for you uh, from Susan Staples. How large is the AMA delegation? The, a the APA delegation? No, AMA. There is no AMA delegation, the, but the, you're like trying, the, House the House of, of Delegates. The House of Delegates has around 600 members, and and it works just like the House of Representatives. You get one delegate for every 1,000 uh, members. So in the APA, you get one delegate in any organization from, you know, the American, uh, you know, Society of Anesthesiologists, uh, you know, to the ACOG. You get one delegate for every 1,000 AMA members you have. And so uh, the A, so, so for instance, the APA has seven delegates, um, but uh, in the House of Delegates, it's about 600. But remember those 600 were sent there from their respective, either their states or their specialty society. So of course, I'm also very engaged and involved here in Georgia, Medical Association of Georgia. And uh, you know, so MAG sends their delegation. 
uh, to the AMA. So all told, I, I think the largest delegations are the American Academy of uh, Family Physicians and the American College of Physicians. They have quite large uh, delegations. So I don't know all the numbers. And then we have some smaller specialty societies that just have one mighty delegate. I know Barbara McEnany, the former chair, uh, started as a representative from ASCO, uh, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, right? And, uh, and just one delegate, but boy, was that a mighty delegate. Barbara was elected as, as president of the AMA. So uh, it depends, and that changes every year, right? If you lose AMA members after a certain number of years, you might lose a delegate, but it's around 600, a little over 600 uh, delegates. Um, mental health question. There's a peri-pandemic or pandemic aftershock of mental health issues, depression and eating, especially among kids and maybe even more so kids of color. How do we equip them better to get ahead of these issues? I'll stop yeah, I, I'm I'm worried about that, but I and I'm I'm a, I'm a people uh, who know me, and I've long said words and language matters, and I try to be real precise. So I'm worried about uh, our children. Um, I've been talking a lot about the need, you know, what to get back to school. Everyone's talking about that, but here's what I've been somewhat disappointed in is the rhetoric. And I and I will always say this. I'm always disappointed in rhetoric. I mean, it, you know, the old adage, my grandmother, everyone has heard this talk is cheap. It's about what are you going to do? And I say that about people ask me a lot you know, what should an organization, an institution, an academic center, a corporate, a Fortune 100 company, what should they do right now regarding um, these equity issues? And of course, we had the whole issues uh, around police brutality and uh, the disproportionate impact on black uh, people in, in this, this country. Uh, that's been tough for me. I, I can tell you personally, I felt that. And in my, at the end of my, um, uh, term this past year, I showed a picture, uh, and I don't think I'll uh, cry, but I showed a picture of men in my family who were at my inauguration. And you know, we we do it up now at the AMA. No, no question. Uh, we have a formal. You know, I had a gown. I took the oath of office, the black tie affair, and had so mem many members of my family uh, there who had traveled far and wide. And I and I we took a picture of all the men in my family who had traveled, and I said, "Here are the men in my family. Many of you met last year. They are not safe in certain places to walk on the street. They were safe and welcomed by AMA and safe in the ballroom of the Hyatt Regency, uh, but not always safe to to walk or jog or run." Because see, I'm getting a little bit choked up here. So uh, we have to address these issues. And the first thing all institutions must, must do is look internally and, and have an unflinching truth-telling look at what, who's around your decision-making tables. Um, you know, what are you doing? Looking at your policies, are you contributing? And I'm proud to say uh, that the AMA is doing that. AMA, not a perfect organization. People know that Years ago, African-American physicians couldn't join the AMA, right? Uh, but in 2009, uh, then uh, President uh, Ron Davis, he's since uh, deceased, unfortunately, apologized. And that was the beginning of the journey, not the end of the journey at AMA. And we've done a lot of work then. I won't, we don't have time to delineate everything, but 2000, uh, a couple of years ago, we established the Center for Health Equity and hired our first chief health equity officer, Dr. Aletha Maybank. And we are on our journey, because it's a journey, not a destination, to embed health equity into the DNA of the AMA. We are not, we didn't turn, and I, and I made sure this and many others, we didn't turn, to, we're not looking to Aletha to fix the problem. And this happens a lot in institutions. They hire a DEI person, and the DEI person then owns it and is accountable. And so when leaders uh, have talked to me, I've talked to CEOs, and they, I said, own health equity or own equity in your organization as the CEO. So um, on as, the, yes, sorry, yes. No problem. So on the equity issue, uh, Dr. Sandy Mayer says, as an African-American and role mo model in medicine, how do you prime the pipeline to encourage more people of color to enter the health professions, contributing, contributing to the mitigation of structural racism and inequities in healthcare? Where do we start? Well, so we prime the pipeline, I believe, by starting early with our, our 
children and making sure that they um, have what they need. And, and, and this is something that I say to young uh, children, I say to everyone in the audience, um, as we start in preschool and make sure there are resources, socio-emotional resources, and there's adequate education and there's parity in education. We don't have some children. Uh, Ray, you, Ray and I were chatting right before um, the interview and I told him that um, you know, I wasn't prepared as well prepared as some of my peers when I went to college. And uh, you know, we we have educational, we have school systems that are based on uh, uh, property taxes, right? And so years ago we had redlining, and so uh, you you have uh, certain communities of color who live in an area that may be next to an environmental hazard, right? Because of redlining and those uh, discriminatory policies, you know, in the '40s and '50s, right? And so if you live next door to an environmental hazard, your property values are gonna be lower. So that's a, a not as good of a tax base to the educational system. So, you know, we can be mentors and role models to our young, but all of us in this room, the adults in the room have to make sure that we are engaged in the conversation to make sure our educational institutions have the resources that uh, they need. Um, uh, that uh, people, and, and this is again, and by the way, I know this is a healthcare audience and these problems are not ours alone to solve, but we do have to be a part of the conversation around a good paying jobs and, you know, transportation and, and whether or not you live in a food desert. So we've got to start young, uh, but we've got to make sure that the systems are uh, in place that allow everyone the equitable opportunity to achieve. I got about uh, three minutes left and two questions, both on COVID. Uh, first one from Dr. Adam Cohen. During the early part of the COVID spread, the White House and C CDC were not recommending lockdowns or sh shelter in place. AMA was also not recommending such actions, but was focusing a lot on hand hygiene and uh, PPE. Did the AMA feel pressure not to make more bold recommendations on the public health front? No. I can say that unequivocally because I was president and uh, we did not receive any pressure uh, nor would any pressure have worked. Um, you know, I said exactly, you know, very early on, you know, we were learning as uh, we were going and more information. And um, I believe, and I said this, and I will tell you, I, I said this to my team that um, I, I, would, I wanted us to be very careful about what we said, not because of pressure, but, but I wanted uh, to be able to stand by based on the evidence at the time remarks, right? And uh, so as we learn more, because we all thought, well, we need masks, we need to make sure our health uh, professionals had masks, or maybe we don't, but as we uh, learn more about the um, uh, the pandemic, uh, we, we based on the data change recommendations, but that was based on the data and the science, not any pressure. Um, the Patrice, the uh, country's now one year, the world's now one year into this uh, pandemic that's cost over 400,000 Americans their lives. One in 800, one in 800 African Americans have died uh, due to COVID-19. Uh, what needs to change? Well, we have to be more focused on the determinants of why more black and brown folks are uh, dying. It, you know, originally, and I'll just say this, I was, um, and I elevated this, um, we, we didn't have, we didn't even have the data, uh, race data, gender, and we also needed zip code data, right? And that, that was one of the early recommendations of the AMA was we need to collect this data. Um, and I particularly cared about the zip code data and overlaying that data because if we found that there was a higher um, illness um, incidence or hospitalization, then we need to take resources to that community, right? And make sure, and of course, we saw that our essential workers didn't have the luxury, the privilege of staying home and did we get in early enough to provide them with personal uh, protective equipment? We did not. And I remember having a conversation early on uh, with a local elected official here in uh, DeKalb and he asked me what we could do. And I said, one thing that you could do, I mean, lots that he could do, but we were talking about the fact that our, our first line workers who had you know, continued to work, but they may live in a multi-generational home. They didn't have the luxury of going to another bedroom even sometimes or the basement. I heard some folks say, well, I'm living in my basement and that's good. 
but sometimes we um, didn't appreciate that not everyone. And so one of the things that they did was they had hotel rooms. So if one of their essential workers, you know, were positive or needed to um, isolate, um, the, I'm sorry, quarantine, uh, not sick, uh, then there was a hotel room where they could do so. So there's a lot on our uh, to-do list, but we need to make sure that, uh, and re let me just say resources, resources, resources. Schools need to open, but they need to have resources open. We need a broad comprehensive testing strategy. Uh, we need to make sure this data is mapped out by zip code and we need to go to communities, ask them what they need, and then uh, be um, uh, committed and accountable to providing them the resources that they need. Outstanding. Uh, Dr. Robert Wachter, our next guest has a tough act to follow. Our next chat talk will be Dr. Robert Wachter, professor and chair of medicine uh, at U University of California, San Francisco. And he'll be joining us March 2nd at 12 noon. Uh, Dr. Harris. I'm glad I didn't have to follow Dr. <laughs> Wachter. He's been amazing throughout this uh, pandemic. Thank you so much. On behalf of the University of Rochester Center for Health and Technology, Dr. Harris, thank you very much for all your work. Thank you for spending some time with us. And thank you for your continued advocacy and serving as such an outstanding role model for all of us uh, to follow. Thank you. My pleasure.